Okay, welcome everyone to our fourth, right? Fourth and final session of continuing the conversation. Um, we're talking about understanding systemic racism and promoting social justice. We have been talking about these issues all semester and today we wanna kind of bring it to action and what can we do moving forward. So um, we are going to begin today with um, a beautiful performance. As you'll see, we're gonna work through today and kind of demonstrate how the arts and performance can also speak to these issues of social justice. So we wanna start with a performance by um, Serene Quick. And so I'm gonna bring Serene up. And when she's ready, I'll start the music. So you tell me. Thank you so much, Serene, for that powerful performance. Um, we will now bring up Dr. Kamika Murphy. Dr. Murphy is Assistant Professor of Atlantic History at Stockton. Her research interests focus on peoples of African descent in the Atlantic world. More particularly, she works on gender and migrant communities, refugees and asylum, transitions to freedom in a period of slavery the age of revolutions, black military experiences, and social movements for change. Dr. Murphy also does work in the public humanities on projects surrounding museums, memory, and corporate social responsibility. Please give a warm round of applause to Dr. Murphy. Thank you very much. Can you see me smiling? <laughs> <laughs> it is such an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to, you know, join you this afternoon to talk about something so timely and important. And so as part of our continuing conversation about 
social and racial justice, I'm here to touch bases on the place where stories fit, where we talk about the narratives and how they contribute to uh, the changing the movement or pushing forward the movement. So I've thought long and hard about, you know, how to broach this conversation, particularly in such a challenging time. And given that a lot of the issues that we are grappling with, I also identify with. And, you know, I decided to, sorry, this is not working. Go ahead, thank you. I decided to start with a little reflection. My first experience of learning about the African-American journey in the United States was as a grad student doing my PhD, which meant that I would have already done quite a number of studies that would have touched on the experiences of Afro peoples. But in this one class, the first time we talked about the African Americans was in the showing of a documentary that centered on the Middle Passage. In that class, I was the only black student. I was sitting in the center of the room and I felt like everybody's eyes were on me. They might not have even noticed me. But in that moment, I felt small. I felt confused, I was be bewildered, and to some extent embarrassed. It took me many years to understand what those feelings were and why I felt that way. And then I realized that the challenge was not what was being shown, not that black people had been enslaved and that we persevered through slavery, but that the narrative I was being given in this class started with slavery. We had not been given any other context. And so the image and memory that it was being reinforced in my mind was that of my people, people who looked like me, my ancestors, only in servitude and nothing else. And so I want to talk to you today about the importance of changing the narrative, not to overlook slavery, but to expand our understanding and presentation of our peoples. So that when we think about the African-American experience, when we see the descendants of these people, when we grapple with the challenges that we're faced with today, we can, as social theorists will say, access very different images that allow us to see black people as such people, humans, not a process through which they were being dehumanized. And so then what my experience in that class meant was that the sequence and the story that starts with slavery was perpetuating a notion that the first significant narrative of Africans and their descendants was slavery. And so what does that mean for us today? It means that history, the historical narrative, the stories that we tell and that we are told our negotiations of power. In that one moment, I felt the power of someone who could determine what that story was. And that history is a form of representation. Storytelling is a form of representation. And that that power is exercised through control. Representation in this respect means a depiction, a portrayal, 
the image that we are drawn in. And at the roots of that image for us, as descendants of Africa, when the first significant narrative is slavery, is one of racism. Because as you see, and most of you must already know, that our introduction to the literature on experiences in the Americas was one that relegated us to commodity, a process of dehumanization. And so in that, we were also being presented into or introduced to the stage at a disadvantage. And so I had a point here at the bottom that the racial politics of slavery then, that bolsters these legal codes, determined that enslaved peoples and their descendants to this very day would grapple with narratives of representation. And I add a list of real legal underpinnings, right? That these contexts determined that the enslaved people should not read their stories. It was illegal to read and write, and this is why people like Frederick Douglass said, the true freedom for his people was learning to read and write. The enslaved peoples were not to remember who they are. They were not to retain language, retain their own power to self-identify. And the griot, the storyteller, was to be devalued. The result then, what we are seeing today, is a constant struggle to retell that story. And many of you who are attuned to representations of Afro peoples in the media can attest to this, where we see people who fall victim to racial violence are only represented a certain way. We don't get to see who they are, that they were not just a person, but that they had family and that they, ambition, they had ambitions and that they were loved. That's a narrative that we don't always get. The fight then for racial justice, for social justice, is a struggle um, that is centered on cultural oppression, changing the narrative. Stories of African Americans, stories of Afro diasporic peoples outside the US, representations of blackness, shape the perceptions and the treatment that people receive. And so therefore, social justice includes paying closer attention to those stories and who gets to tell them. To provide some context to this, I pulled on uh, some of the more prolific theorists who have paved the way for us to understand how narratives work and the relevance it has for us today. Michel Ralph Truyo, who was an expert on Haiti, wrote a prolific book called silence in the past, and he says that there is power, this power translates in determining not just what story is told or what narrative we hear, but whose story is being told, who gets to tell it, whose stories and archives get funding, who doesn't get it, whose um, artifacts get um, preserved, conserved, whose doesn't. And the, the fact of the matter is that for many years, these, uh, this power worked against those who were from Afro descent. We, or, our voices were not represented in these historical narratives. And so what happens as Edouard Glissant from the French Caribbean tells us is that we struggle with a fragmented memory. That when these narratives are told for us, we end up with pieces of the puzzle 
one name of someone who did something wonderful, or a part of a story of how we change something, but we can't put it together in a synthesized narrative. We have fragments, pieces. And so then it has been the challenge for many people, right, who have been working tirelessly to mend those fragments. And I want to stand here today and, 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 and tell you that in thinking about how we create change in today's society, we should also consider how we can tell those stories to change the narrative. Changing that narrative has implications for representation. And changing how people are represented has implications for debunking stereotypes of those people. An example that I took that I thought would be very interesting for us is that of Haiti. We've learned a lot about the age of revolutions, a lot about the American Revolution even, but not enough about the place that African Americans played in these revolutionary movements, in the forming of the United States. We learned about Haiti as a rebellion, but never about Haiti as a revolution, because it means something else, right? When we use those terms and place Haiti squarely in the center of the age of revolutions. And then when we wrote about Haiti, uh, it was merely in glancing at it. And then there are many other examples in which we can apply this to uh, the experiences of African Americans in the United States. One would be the massacre in Tulsa. Many of us never really heard or knew or understand the significance of Black Wall Street. And that is just now getting the attention it deserves. Or narratives that tell us that the people who were captured and chattel were slaves. And so we use words like slaves rather than using terms enslaved to recognize the process of bondage. Or one of my favorites, while I was preparing for <laughs> this talk, I was doing some you know, general search and I saw PBS wrote this as the 10 little known black history facts. And it lists as number five of the 12.5 million Africans shipped to the New World during the transatlantic slave trade, fewer than 388,000 arrived in the United States. I'm not quite sure how to read that. I'm not sure if it's an accomplishment or what, but it's one of the best known facts, right? Little known facts about black history. Why does it matter then? If history is representation, then it is also cultural reproduction. The narratives must gain a platform to have a role in promoting social and racial justice. And we, it can do this through decoding that cultural oppression, to contest power structures, to increase diversity, to center the experiences and the contributions of people of Afro descent to break the silence, to debunk stereotypes, to mend the memories. The pathways to this include simply supporting, funding, and appreciating the stories of Africans and people of African descent, learning those stories, teaching them in our classes, integrating them into all the different disciplines that we teach, giving them a rightful place in recognizing the contributions that black people have made throughout our society, treating race as a historical category, rejecting singular boundaries, appreciating a wide range of other contexts, including the experience as it relates to migration, cultural retention, assimilation, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, to place these narratives 
in a broader context of our local, national, and global discourse. And I think that's interesting for, even for us here in New Jersey. Um, I've encountered many uh, people who ask me as the historian here at Stockton, you know, is it true that Harriet Tubman's um, uh, movement the, and, 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 and the, the, <laughs> the trade that freed people, right? So, did it come through New Jersey and was it in South Jersey and what was our role? And there are tons and tons of people who are doing the work of black people in South Jersey, but they're not given the place that they deserve in showing how these African-American experiences shape the narrative. And so then we come to my favorite part of this session where I'm going to engage you a little bit as a way to think about how the telling of stories can change narratives and debunk these stereotypes. So I'm going to ask you to think about who you are. On your phones, or if you have pen and paper, I want you to draw these little circles. And I want to put you to put your name in the center circle. In the blue circles, I invite you to list some important identifiers. Things that you think are, you know, defining who you are. So for me, I'm Kamika. And in the blue circles, my identifiers might be black, woman, mother, historian. Now, the second part of this activity. The second part of this activity will ask you to then choose any one of those identifiers and think of a stereotype that is associated with it. And then we're going to do something very powerful. I want you to write who you are. I am. List the identifier. But I am not. And list the stereotype. Now we're going to think about the thought process that you engaged in making this affirmation. And if you are so willing to oblige, would there be one or two of you who would be willing to share with us? Share your statement with us. I wrote, I am a black woman, but I am not angry. Anyone else would like to share with us? Thank you so much. We have one more person. I said, I'm gay, but I am not a monster. Thank you. I can share mine. OK, go ahead. I put, I am beautiful, but I'm not worthless. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can, can they hear me? Yeah. 
the team, so everyone online can hear us, but um, they were supposed to be able to hear us in the um, in the event center. But please, if you're well, if you yes, we can hear you, Dr. Dr. Carr. Share with us. They can hear. They can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I am bisexual, but I am not broken. Is what I wrote. Thank you. Anyone else in our virtual audience want to participate? I wrote, I am black, but I am not ghetto. I wrote, I am black, but I'm not angry. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Was that someone else? Yeah, I'm a black man, but I'm not lazy. Thank you. All right. Now, I hope this, that this very simple but powerful exercise translates to you and to our community, right? that we are so much more and that we have the power to shape the stories told, to change the narrative, to reject stereotypes. Can I? I want to go to the other slide. Thank you. So I'm going to wrap up. But we're going to have other opportunities to pull on what we are talking about here and uh, bring it all together in a much larger discussion. But I hope that you would have observed from this exercise that you are more than this stereotype that anyone, any person, any um, power structure in the society projects on you. And I hope it also renews your consciousness in the usefulness of and power of sharing what has been marginalized voices. And to tie this then back to this larger conversation, I want to emphasize that diversity does not equate, is not synonymous with inclusion. While diversity means presenting multiple perspectives, having variations, showing differences, and that sort of thing, inclusion is something very different. It is not just being present, but it's the process and the active seeking out, understanding, valuing, integrating the experiences of those multiple perspectives, variations, and differences. And then it requires empowering people to have that decision-making capacity to shape that narrative. So then I encourage you to continue to rethink narratives and mend the fragments as we reshape the representations that are informing the treatment of people. It is using power to recognize, to understand, and give credence to the multiple stories of peoples of African descent. And of course, the underlying lesson here is that there is no one monolithic blackness, no single black experience. And we want to open the doors to telling those stories and changing the narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for participating um, in that very powerful activity. Um, thank you, Dr. Murphy, uh, for your words and for helping us to kind of see how, you know, we have all of these different um, connections that we make. We are all part of more than one group, and we are not, there's not just one perspective of being a person of color. So thank you so much for that. Um, 
We are now going to take a look at some artwork and again, see how the artistic point of view can also express social justice. Um, so I wanna bring up Megan Coates and her pieces of art um, are called Say Their Names, See Their Faces. And within the room, I'm hoping that maybe we can just kind of walk by the art so that we can see it. And hopefully uh, there's a way for the folks online to be able to see it as well. Um, so she's going to talk about it a little bit and introduce what her work is all about. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this um, started out basically as, I don't know, it's kind of hard to put into words. I guess that's better. Um, it, this is kind of hard to put into words. Um, it started out, I guess, in a place of um, powerlessness. I felt like I keep seeing these stories on the news and online, and um, like I find myself having to log out and just turn the television off and to just stay away from all of the news because of how traumatizing the footage is of watching for nine minutes an officer kneel on someone's neck and, until they're dead, or to witness um, a 12-year-old boy being shot because he's holding a toy gun in his hand. I was just getting very traumatized from the footage, as I'm sure a lot of us were. Um, but at the same time, turning it off, logging off, not looking at it, also kind of felt like I was ignoring it. Um, so I remember a very poignant quote from Dr. King a very long time ago, um, he said that he always marched in his Sunday best and he always asked the people protesting with him to march in their Sunday best because the visual that it provided to see these people in their suits and little children in dresses and skirts um, being hosed and mauled by dogs, it's, it's a very poignant sight. Um, so I wanted to make a calendar, and I think we're so used to seeing the faces with bruises and, you know, autopsy photos, and I'm just so, I was so tired of that. So I wanted to create sort of a calendar, whereas we would look at the faces, these victims of injustice and police brutality in a different way. I wanted people to see these people as human beings and not just as victims, not just as bodies, corpses, another case study, another case of some black person being murdered. Like I was, I'm tired of that. And I'm, because it doesn't seem to be working, it just only seems to be traumatizing me further. Um, so I figured that the only way to, um, to bring it forward is not to show the pictures that we're so used to seeing, but the pictures of these people as they lived in everyday life. Um, this is Botham Jean, and he was sitting in his house, and um, he was eating ice cream, if I'm not mistaken, and a police officer who was apparently tired from a long day of work entered the wrong apartment, his apartment, and shot him under the impression, she said, that um, he was an intruder and he died, he lost his life, in his own home eating ice cream. And there's so many, I've seen so many other images of this young man that, and this young, this image is not shown enough. And I think this is an image that is worth remembering. At the same time, we have to remember what happened to him. And I think it's very important, it's poignant if we see this image and then we're reminded of what happened versus some other image that is rem reminiscent of the violence, but not reminiscent of the life that was lost. Um, this is Breonna Taylor. And um, if you don't know, Breonna Taylor was an emergency medical technician. And I identified with this because I was an emergency medical technician. And I can't imagine being exhausted in my home, sleeping, and never waking up, simply because somebody messed up some paperwork. Like, that's really what it boils down to. This is Elijah McClain. 
Elijah was a musician. <laughs> I'm a musician. <laughs> and he used to go to the local veterinarian's office and play the violin to the kittens to soothe them. Elijah McLean was injected with, I think, the 10 or maybe even 20 the amounts of ketamine that belongs like in a human, human's body because he was quote unquote out of control when the police arrived. He had autism and he's no longer living. This is Sandra Bland. She was starting a new job. She'd just gotten a new job and she reportedly failed to use her turning signal and was arrested. And on paper, it says that Ms. Bland committed suicide um, because she was arrested and I guess couldn't deal with being incarcerated, so she killed herself. That's how the story goes, but um, she was on her way to a new job. <laughs> she had just gotten a new job. And I can't remember how many times I've been excited and on my way to a new job. How many of us can remember being hired and on our way to our orientation, on our way to you know starting everything and forgetting to signal and losing our lives. This is Tamir Rice, and he was just a child. Like, I remember drawing this picture, and I remember specifically as I was sketching out his, his teeth and his mouth, like I specifically remember remembering to myself that his teeth weren't even formed yet. Like, you know how you hit puberty and you still have those funny teeth that, he still had those. He wasn't even, he hadn't even reached puberty yet. And he's outside playing with a toy and he was murdered. And they don't show this picture very often. They actually show the still of him being murdered. They don't, they don't show this picture very often. And so I'm, I'm not finished yet. I only have five pictures. Um, I plan on having 12. I think the most difficult part is choosing which 12 to place on the calendar because there's so many faces to choose from. There's so many lives to choose from. Um, so I just wanted to share this because eventually it's gonna, it's gonna be a calendar and hopefully everyone will buy it. <laughs> and hopefully everyone will hang it somewhere because I want people to walk by and I want people to ask, who's that? And I want, be, I want someone to be able to say who that person is and so that their story can continue on. And I think it's very, relevant, very re <clears throat> relevant to the previous presentation because I think what happens is the stories get lost in all of the violence and all of the confusion and all of the trauma. And I think sometimes we have to stop and focus on the faces and the lives. And if we do that, I think that brings a little bit more humanity um, to the people that lost their lives. And so that's, that's it, that's all I really had to say. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'll be reading my spoken word piece entitled On Your Knees. And this is dedicated to all of the black lives lost. If you can only feel tall while someone else is on their knees, something is wrong with you. Let me rephrase. If you can only feel glorified while someone else is dehumanized, something is wrong with you. Let me rephrase again. If you can only feel alive while someone else shrivels up and dies, something is wrong with you. Brown skinned ebony covered knees forced a cursed ground for centuries, a cursed ground of oppression made of hot coals and piercing gravel, supple brown-skinned ebony knees, kneeling through centuries of yes sir and yes ma'am, of going through the back door and walking in sullied gutters, of answering to boy as a man, of being told no and you cannot, of working four times as hard to be as good, to end up not being enough, 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 brown-skinned ebony knees, kneeling for centuries, scarred, strained, black with decay, sticking to their newfound prayer mat as they pray for the day to stand. On your knees, 1944. Reesey was coming from church. 
She was on the wrong road at the wrong time, with the wrong skin, south of the Mason-Dixon line, a black blemish in a white world that a gang of six white boys sought to erase. She was forced to her back, to her stomach, to her knees. No charges were made, the final spit in her face. Nobody cared, the whore was black, on your knees. 2005, Lavina wanted to be just like her daddy. She joined the army, suited up in her camouflage threaded armor, uniformed in supposed solidarity. She wanted to fight for her country. Yet she was the black sheep in the white flock, a black blemish in a white world that her male comrades sought to erase. She was forced to her back, to her stomach, to her knees. Her dead body possessed the scars of torture, yet no charges were made. The final spit of bile on her name, cause of death, suicide. I'm sorry to inform you that your daughter did this to herself. Let me rephrase. Nobody cared. The whore was black. Brown skinned ebony knees forced to curse the ground for centuries. You see, I've been trying to stand, but my shackles dig its rusted ridges into my skin. They won't let me. On your knees, boy. 1955. Emmett was visiting from Chicago. A black teenage boy in the throes of puberty, just trying to see his family in the crown jewel of the Confederacy, Mississippi, where brown skin teeming with melanin was probable cause for suspicion, where brown skin teeming with melanin was a presumed weapon, where brown skin teeming with melanin was the evidence of the absence of innocence, the word of a white woman who cried wolf, who cried black beast, led two white men to kill the beast who sought to feast on a white woman's glorified white sanctity. Let me rephrase, led two white wolves to drag an innocent black boy on his knees into the darkness of night as they mangled his body, ripped into his flesh, snatched the beat from his still growing chest, threw him in the river like he was nothing but the carcass of a pest. The final spit in his face, the men were both acquitted. His life didn't matter. He was just another nigger. Brown skin, ebony knees, forced to curse the ground for centuries. 2009. Oscar was at the train station at Fruitvale. With his hands up, he was forced to his knees, then to his stomach. He pled for his life, his young daughter in his mind, but he possessed skin of the wrong kind. He was shot, living while black, in the back, while the officers checked his shackles, his handcuffs. They were still intact on your knees. 1999. Amadou was in front of his house. His brown skin teeming with melanin was probable cause for suspicion. His brown skin teeming with melanin was a presumed weapon. He was shot standing while black, 41 times to be exact, 2016. Alton was selling CDs. His brown skin teeming with melanin was probable cause for suspicion. His brown skin teeming with melanin was a presumed weapon. He was shot selling while black, 2015. Sandra was driving, driving while black, pulled over, detained, and booked for a failed lane signal. Her brown skin teeming with melanin was probable cause for suspicion. Her brown skin teeming with melanin was a presumed weapon. She was found lynched in her cell, a truth that they will never tell. Tamir shot dead playing while black. Brianna shot dead sleeping while black. Ahmad shot dead jogging while black. Philando, Freddie, Eric, Trayvon. Since when did living while black become my death sentence? Since when did I have to count down to my execution? Brown skin, ebony covered knees, forced to curse the ground for centuries. On your knees. I said on on your knees, on your knees. I can't get up. I'm trapped on my knees, strangled by the piercing smoke of the burning flesh of the ever flowing bloodshed. It's getting hard to breathe. The once supple skin now scarred, cracked with dried blood. My knees are going numb. I'm becoming numb. Brown-skinned ebony knees, forced to curse the ground for centuries. Cousins, brothers, fathers, sisters, mothers, swing in the trees that sway in the breeze to the melody of oh say, can you see? Calloused hands trapped and rusted chains are placed at the base of whipped backs to keep us from fighting back. Bald fists writhe under the rusted shackles of discrimination, targeted systematic denigration to ignite a proliferation of separation and destruction. The smoke of the burning flesh fills the lungs, choking, gasping, wheezing, as we begin to wheeze, begging to God, uttering George's last words, please. I can't breathe. Brown skinned, ebony covered knees, forced to curse the ground for centuries. I hope that one day I'll be free. Thank you.
for that powerful, powerful piece. If we didn't have mask on, we could like, woo, -hoo! we could do more, because that was, that was powerful. Um, our last speaker today, we're gonna bring up Dr. Nordia Johnson. This whole series, um, you know, she has organized, she has worked incredibly hard to bring you all of these um, discussions that we've had throughout the semester. And she's just been working very hard as interim director of academic achievement program. She's in the D division of student affairs. She develops and creates pathways to high impact practices that facilitate thriving in higher education. Her role centers on bridging achievement and retention gaps by advancing equitable access to those high impact practices that can be used to buffer the risk of negative outcomes among underrepresented students. Throughout her career, Dr. Johnson has conducted research and led initiatives that examined best practices for supporting students of color and subsequently used this research to coordinate initiatives and develop programs to foster success among Black and Latinx students, specifically those students. Dr. Johnson teaches in psychology program and advances the research body surrounding the promotion of resilience among college women from underrepresented communities. Let's give a hand to Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Allison, for that introduction. And thank you to all of you, um, particularly those students who have performed thus far your performances have been phenomenal, so, so meaningful. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you a bit of my research and tying it in with social justice. I'm gonna do my best to be brief because we have a quite exciting activity for you at the end of this presentation, really to culminate this entire series. So we're gonna talk about today. What's the role of the institution in promoting social justice. So we've talked about systemic racism. We've talked about racism at the individual level. We looked at microaggressions and things of that nature. Today we're gonna to talk about what can we do as an institution of higher ed. And many of the things we're gonna talk about today are also applicable to other institutions as well. So before we get to that, let's make sure we all have the same fundamental knowledge of what is social justice? One of the most common definitions of social justice is equitable bargaining powers, equitable rights and opportunities, and the removal of oppressive systems. So many of you might already be familiar with the image you see on your screen. You see on the left side, equality, where each person has the exact same benefit. They all have one crate, right? or one box. Equity is the idea of giving everyone what they actually need. So you're not giving everyone the same, which is what you see in the first photo, but you're giving them what they actually need, right? And a good example of this is affirmative action. What we're gonna talk about today, and what we've been talking about throughout this series, is about justice. It's about systemically removing the oppressive uh, situations, institutions, whatever it is that is causing a need to give someone additional support is what we need to focus on. So if you look at the final photo, you'll see the difference there is the barrier was changed. So now no one needs any special accommodations, but everyone has the same opportunities, right? So Dr. Allison started us off earlier in this series, back in September, I believe, talking about systemic racism and some of the systemic barriers that were put in place. The idea here at the final conversation is about how can we remove those things, okay? So now that we have a general understanding of social justice, which we've been talking about for a while now, what does it matter? Why does it matter in the context of college? Why does it matter here at Stockton and at other institutions throughout the United States and across the world, really? Well, 
The thing is, excuse me, let's go back to that one. Okay. The thing is, what we often hear is African American students or Latinx students don't perform as well. They drop out at higher rates, their GPAs are lower. However, when we look at why, oftentimes we may talk about, well, they're not as motivated. Or if you look at the K-12 system especially, they're just not as smart. Some individual level factors that are really blaming the victims, which we're going to talk about later on. But why it matters here is because all the things we've talked about throughout this series, all the factors of oppression at the systemic level, translates to higher education. Just like last week, we talked about employment. Dr. Carr talked to us about the under and unemployment within communities of color, right? Uh, we also had Dr. Reeves talk about how that permeates to the sciences. So it matters in higher education because it matters in every single domain of our society. Uh-oh. Okay, so. <laughs> Play around with the clicker here. All right, so in, in higher ed, in college, we typically talk about the fact that enrollment is going up among students of color. In fact, some people often say, well, it's getting better because we're getting more diverse. But as Dr. Murphy alluded to, diversity does not equate inclusion, right? It doesn't mean that we're more socially just because we're more diverse. So this graph illustrates the fact that, in fact, we are more diverse, right? What you see here is that between 2000, the year 2000, 2010, and 2018, there's been an increase. Um, not super great, right? But if you look at Latinx, for example, the, the Hispanic population, you see 22% in the year 2000, up to 36% in 2018. If you look at the black students, and this is nationwide, by the way, you look at the black students you see back in 2000, we were at around 31. And then we went up to 38 and went back down a little bit, right? So we see that where students of color are concerned, we are enrolling in college at higher rates, right? But enrollment is only half the battle. What's the good of getting you here if we can't keep you here to achieve your goals? You came here for your degree, and so the next slide looks at, are we able to achieve the second part of that? So after we get you here, are we keeping you here? Are we graduating you? So if you take a look at the legend on the right side, you'll see that the darkest color green looks at four-year graduation rates. So in comparison to 45% of white students, only 21% of black students graduate in four years. Only 32% of Hispanic students graduate in four years, right? And you can take a look at the remaining years for yourself, but the general idea here is we are becoming more diverse across the nation and in higher ed. However, we are not making sure that you are able to actually achieve your goals once you get here. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. How does this come about? Why is this happening? And this goes back to a lot of what you've learned about throughout this series. If you look at the very first one, there are systemic factors that are at play. There are institutional factors, and there are individual level factors. So I could have provided you with a number of examples, but there's only one here listed for each. And so at the systemic level, it says reproduction of oppressive systems and limited transmission of asset generating resources. What does that mean? Basically, if you think all the way back to Dr. Allison's presentation where we touched on slavery, if you think back to what Dr. Murphy just talked to you about, you can recall 
that way back then, we were initially not given the same opportunities. In fact, there were no opportunities, right? We were enslaved. And so what can you pass on to the next generation? Some level of that same enslavement is what you're passing on. Okay, so what that first bullet is basically saying is, if you think to your ancestors, the fact is, you are at a disadvantage from the very beginning. So until those oppressive systems that place you at that disadvantage, until those things are addressed, we continue to give generation after generation the same problems, the same level of oppression. And it may look different, right? We talked about microaggression in the second session. So it looks different. It's not always blatant anymore. However, it still has some of those very similar effects. So the next one is institutional. And at the institutional level, and today we're focusing on college, so I'm gonna give you an example from the higher ed world. What does it look like to reinforce power structures? Well, I've had the pleasure of interacting with a lot of you all as students of color in my little bit over a year at Stockton. And one of the most common things I've heard is this low sense of belonging because you don't see people who look like you. And I see some head nods even now, right? So when you are in the classroom and you recognize that most of your professors do not look like you, administration, staff members, et cetera, those things reinforce power structures. Those things impact your ability to actually feel comfortable to thrive in this environment. And lastly, at the individual level, again, an example for today in this day and age is microaggressions, which we talked about in the second session. So that is when someone doesn't um, blatantly perpetuate racism, but they may say something that is undermining of your identity. Right? So we had some examples provided with regards to stereotypes, right? And if someone sees an Asian student and automatically assumes that that student is good at math, makes a comment about that, that is an example of microaggression. So I'm going to start, uh-oh, I'm going to start going a little bit um, faster here because I want to get to the activity. So what do we do about this? How do we respond to this? So my research, as Dr. Allison mentioned, has been on how do we support Black and Latinx students specifically in institutions of higher education. I have looked at a number of different variables throughout my research. One of the ones that have stood out is campus climate. So there is a theory which we'll look at in a moment, resilience theory. And as opposed to focusing on the deficits of students of color, it looks at how come some of these students are doing well despite all the obstacles that they're facing. And so I use that theory to determine what is it amongst a small group of Black and Latinx female college students that was actually leading to positive outcomes for those students. And the strongest variable, the strongest factor that came out of that study was campus climate. So what is campus climate? Campus perceptions, campus experiences, and also the perceptions of an institution's action and commitment to equity and inclusion. So if this for you all as students of color turns out to be something positive, so if you respond to a campus climate survey, for example, and your experiences are positive, your perceptions are positive, and your perceptions of the institutional commitment is positive, that is linked to increased academic achievement among Black and Latinx female college students specifically. 
So let's look at, don't worry, we're not gonna go over this whole thing. We don't have time. But as a community psychologist, this is one of the theories that we look at most often. And what this is basically saying is you need to look at every single level at which a student can be supported. So there's the individual in the middle. Then you have the microsystem, the mesosystem, the exosystem, and the macrosystem. So if you're interested in going into detail about those things, feel free to come find me. <laughs> However, we're going to move on. And what I'm going to show you next is what we can do to promote a healthy campus climate for students of color within each of these levels. Before we do that, actually, we're also going to touch on resilience theory for a moment. So resilience theory, as I mentioned, basically says among a population that typically underperforms, typically is faced with a number of barriers, there is a small group that's doing very well. Why is this happening? And what this theory says is there are risk factors and there are protective factors. And if the protective factors, which are positive factors that allow the student to avert risk, if those are greater than the risk factors, which are negative factors in the environment, then a student has a greater likelihood of positive outcome or being resilient. Okay? So what can we do? I'm almost done here. What can we do as it relates to advancing campus climate? Well, we can reduce risk factors and we can enhance protective factors at every single level at, of the ecological model. Right? So at the microsystemic level, this is where you consider things like faculty members, peers, and everyone else that you interact with one-on-one. -on -one. If we look at things like positive relationships with those individuals at the micro level, that will lead to a healthier campus climate. The mesosystem. The mesosystem looks at a relationship, excuse me, with something that doesn't necessarily have to do with you, but between two microsystems. So let's say your family is a part of your microsystem, you have direct contact with them, and folks in the institution, right? The pan and family programs here work hard to make sure that those connections are positive. So that's an example of what we can do at the mesosystemic level. So that was actually to note that there are some things that we here at Stockton are doing right, right? So the pan and family program, as I mentioned, has a number of programs to make sure that bridge is being connected at the mesosystemic level. The exosystem is where you look at things like something you don't have a direct relationship with, right? But it impacts you. Let's say, for example, the board of trustees. You may not know the members of the board of trustees, but their decisions impact you. So if there are folks, administrators here at the institution who are advocating for you, then that will positively impact you. I'm going to stop at the chrono system in the interest of time, but that is the larger idea of culture, the culture of the institution, um, and how you, how you generally feel as a result of that. Okay? So this is my final slide, and what this is basically saying is much of the literature looks at what is the individual person doing wrong? What is it that an individual person can do differently? What we want to do is say, how can the institution and the systems in which we are embedded, how can those aspects change to better support students of color? So how does campus climate connect with social justice? Well, as I mentioned, you all, students of color, believe it or not, were at a disadvantage from before the moment you stepped foot onto this campus. And that is, again, going all the way back to what we talked about in our very first session. 
However, being at a disadvantage certainly does not mean that you cannot succeed, that you can't thrive, right? And so by shifting the campus climate to one that is supportive of students of color, by engaging in the different areas of the ecological model and enhancing protective factors in those areas, then we're able to advance more equitable outcomes for students of color and ultimately advance towards social justice. All right, so that is what I had for you all in terms of my presentation. But what I'm most excited about is an opportunity for you to talk back to us, for you to be reflective about some of what we've shared with you today. And so uh, one of the wonderful social justice interns have handed out a small fist. And for my folks online, you should also have a virtual opportunity to engage with the small fist. And what I would like you to do is think about everything that you've heard about here today. And if you've been with us for other sessions, think about what you've heard in the previous sessions. And then consider, this is the important part, so listen up. What can you do? What can you do to promote social justice and advance anti-racism here at Stockton? You can also include what you can do in your communities on a larger scale. So think about that and take this seriously. Make it a personal declaration. This is anonymous, so unless you wanna share when we give you the opportunity, you do not have to write your name on those fists. However, please take a moment and truly reflect on that. And then I'll give you all an opportunity to share if you are interested in doing so. I'm thinking about your poem, Malika, so I'm going to channel that when I sing this song, because yeah, I need that. <sighs> I feel like there is a struggle of the past, a hope for the future, and I picked this song because it lives right in the middle. <clears throat> I went up to the mountain because you asked me to up over the clouds to where the skies are blue I can see all around me, everywhere. I can see all around me, everywhere. Sometimes I feel like I've been nothing but tired And I'll be working Till the day I expire Sometimes I lay down, what more can I do? And then I go on again, because you asked me to. Some days I look down, afraid, afraid I will fall. And though the sun shines, I see nothing at all. And then 
I hear your sweet voice singing. Come and then go telling me softly that you love me so. The peaceful valley just over the mountain. The peaceful valley so few have come to know. But sooner or later, I will go. Thank you so much for that beautiful rendition. Uh, at this time, I am most excited to hear from you all in the audience here in person, and also those of you on Zoom. Please note that the instructions for the Zoom activity is in the chat, and we would love to hear your voices as well. So at this time, do we have any, anyone in the audience who would like to share? Please raise your hand. Uh, I will promote social justice, justice and anti-racism by continuously reaching out to other students of color I see to help them feel welcomed and be able to thrive in the campus environment and climate that they are not accustomed to. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I said I will promote social justice and anti-racism by actively listening because the image of the equity versus equality versus justice um, helped me to realize that everybody needs something different and that takes here and first. So. Thank you so much. Anyone else would like to share? How will you promote social justice and anti-racism? If there's anyone online that would like to share, please feel free to unmute yourselves and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. I know this is potentially a difficult activity for some of you, so I'd like to thank, oh, we have a hand. We have a hand. <laughs> I couldn't help it. We have a hand. Oh my God, we have a hand. Oh, you know, it just hit me. I would promote social justice and equity on Stockton by trying to be that faculty member that our students can come to and find a source of support, understanding, sisterhood, brotherhood. You know that when you see Bev, you see a friend. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. <laughs> well, at this time, the hour is certainly far spent. So I would like to go ahead and begin wrapping us up by thanking you all for coming out today and for supporting this tremendous series throughout the entirety of this semester. This has been a collective effort. I'm going to say that again. This has been a largely collective effort. And I am so grateful for all the folks who were speakers, for those who worked behind the scene, and I'd like to recognize them at this time. If you are on the Zoom, please just raise your hand when I call your name. If you are in person, you're welcome to stand. I'd love to recognize you at this time. Dr. Donitris Allison was not only our first speaker, but also, <laughs> a key planning partner for this series. Along with her, I don't believe um, Stephen Davis is with us today, but I'd like to recognize him anyways. He was our second speaker, Assistant Vice President Stephen Davis. Thank you. <laughs> for our second session, we had Dr. Anna Rodriguez, and Dr. Zori Kalibatsova, they're waving online, we can see them there. 
For our third session, we had Dr. Terry Carr and Dr. Tyson Reeves. Thank you all so much. And last but not least, my partner of today, <laughs> Dr. Kamika Murphy. Thank you, thank you so much for your tremendous presentation this evening. It is my sincere hope that all of you have not only advanced your understanding of systemic racism, but that you truly have a desire to promote social justice, and not just a desire, but that you've been able to identify some actionable steps to move us towards social justice individually and collectively. So with that, I'd like to thank you all once more. If you are via Zoom, if you did not actually click on the registration link, please just click register so I can make sure <laughs> we have all of you. We are already over time, so we're not going to do the assessment right now, but I will be sending out a link to the assessment. The assessment is critical because to continue this conversation, we have to know what you guys thought about it, what you want, what do you want us to do differently, and so on. So the final activity for those of you who are in person is to take your small fist as you are leaving and stick it on that large poster that Elise is pointing to right now. Thank you. <laughs> Stick it on that large poster. If you are virtual and you really want to participate in person, we can get you a physical fist as well. Just reach out to us. And I would be largely remiss if I did not recognize my social justice interns, Elise Thompson and Danielle Combs. <laughs> These young ladies have been phenomenal. They've worked with me all semester to make sure that we bring to you an educational and enjoyable experience. And last but not least, Marcus Johnson, I don't believe he's with us today, but Marcus Johnson has also been a phenomenal partner of this series, so I'd like to thank him as well. And if I'm forgetting anyone, please forgive me. Thank you all once again for coming out this evening. Enjoy the rest of your day and look out for more information for next semester.